Let's thank you again for doing this. You do it every year. Uh, you're very kind <coughs> to do it. Well, it'll do. This is sort of an intimidating crowd. This is the biggest crowd I think I've ever seen. Well, and you're being fed into the next room as well. So, <laughs> uh, big crowd. Big crowd. No heckling over there, though. Well, how would you know? <laughs> That's right. Um, as I, I mentioned when I introduced you, you've really had more than one career. Uh, you really, as I think you put it, you're in phase three. But I want to go back to phase one uh, and start with your time at, uh, as a practicing uh, lawyer. Uh, and in that phase of your career, which lasted a number of years, you represented plaintiffs. Uh, you represented actual human beings. Um, could you talk a little bit about that that practice and what you did and what what you liked about it and even anything you didn't like? Uh, I loved it. I, I did that for 27 years, practiced with Manly Brown, who if you don't know Manly, surely you will before you leave. Manly's going to be sitting in that chair later this semester. Oh, good. Well, you will know him then. Terrific lawyer. I mean, one of the best I've ever known. My mentor right out of law school, my adjunct faculty member when I was a student. I think he started teaching in 72, so he's gotten about eight years uh, teaching here. Uh, we had a plaintiff's practice. We also practiced with Hank O'Neill. There's a scholarship here named in Hank's honor. Probably the finest trial lawyer <coughs> I've ever known. I quote him almost daily. Um, and probably will before this session is over. I really enjoyed representing people, and that's in the plaintiff's practice, personal injury practice. That's who we represent. We didn't represent insurance companies. We didn't represent corporations. Um, most of the people we represented were not well educated. Um, most of them were not well placed in society. Uh, most of them would not be able to uh, begin to address their legal problems without somebody's help. And generally, they were very appreciative of what you did for them, and I always liked that. I enjoyed talking with people. That's not to say there's anything wrong with representing corporations and insurance companies. And the law firm I'm with now does that, and I'm engaged in some of that. But when it's uh, everyday business, like it is with insurance adjusters and claims people, um, I mean, it's just one more case. But to the plaintiff, it is the only case. And generally, the only case they'll have, their only involvement with the legal system. And I always treated that as kind of a special uh, relationship. <laughs> and I would encourage you to do the same thing. If you become a plaintiff's lawyer, or you are representing individuals, and they call and make that first appointment, set aside an hour on your calendar, at least an hour, to spend with them. You know, a lot of firms, they'll have a paralegal sit down with this new client and spend 30, 45 minutes taking down information. It may be an hour or so, uh, it may be another day uh, that they finally see a lawyer. But when that person comes with the crisis in their life and they need advice, don't brush them off, don't cut them short on time. Um, we had a lawyer I remember in our firm who was um, an off-counsel lawyer, and I would get him in uh, in an interview with a new client so that maybe this could become his client. And the first two times he got up midway through the interview and walked out. And finally, after that, I, I said, where did you go? He said, well, I've heard you give that spiel about how we handle these cases before. I didn't seem to need to sit in there. And I thought, you missed the point. This hour is about uh, getting to know this client and letting this client get to know you and develop some sense of confidence in that client toward you. If you just get up and walk out, the client uh, doesn't know you. They haven't heard you say anything. They, they haven't had an opportunity to have some interaction with you. And uh, so, set aside an hour to meet with the client. That's not responsive to your question, I know, but I got to thinking about 
that experience. It's important in dealing with people to give them the time they need to understand what this process is about, what you're going to be doing. Um, it was rewarding to me because they always seem to be grateful. I've got, um, I have a, a former client. He used to bring me a bushel of sweet potatoes every year <laughs> around Thanksgiving. Never forgot. Um, I have a, a client, former client, who uh, either brings a ham or a, a cake or a pork shoulder every Christmas. And uh, no matter how many times they say, we're even, you know, you don't need to do this, thank you. They have a Merry Christmas, but, but they come back every year like that. So I think individuals who you help are appreciative. Large businesses, insurance, uh, uh, other corporations, it's it's business, not personal. You don't think the insurance company is going to bring you a bag of sweet potatoes? Mm, not, not likely. <laughs> not <laughs> likely. Um, obviously, I've got a list of questions I want to ask you, and I send them to you ahead of time, you, you, and you know the order that I put them in. But I'm going to go a little bit out of order, if that's okay, sure. because, because you mentioned Mr. O'Neill, uh, and you yeah. mentioned uh, Manley. One of the things in this class we talk about, but we hadn't talked about it much yet, is the importance of mentors in this transition mm -hmm. from novice to expert. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about your mentors, what they meant to you, what they actually did, what the mentor do, uh, and what difference they've made in the art of your career. I think finding the right mentor out of law school is probably the single most important thing you can do to further your career. Um, I was blessed, I mean I grew up with a lawyer for a father. And so I saw how he dealt with this. And I'll just take each of these mentors and touch on them uh, just a minute. To give you an idea of what they did and how important they were to me. Um, I can remember my dad, I mean, he was so dedicated to his clients that he put in, when, he, when I became a teenager, put in a phone, a separate number this phone beside his bed in his bedroom and nobody was allowed to touch it um, unless he was not at the house. If he was in the house, nobody touched it because that's how his clients knew to get in touch with him at night. And I mean all hours of the night. And he had more of a corporate practice, but he'd get calls from all over the country and, and we knew not to touch that phone. That was his dedication. He had an opportunity to be on the Georgia Supreme Court. He had an opportunity to be a United States District Court judge. But he always carried around a little note in his wallet, a little uh, something he clipped, a quote, uh, and I don't remember the exact quote from Abraham Lincoln, but it dealt with um, the importance of a lawyer, lawyer's, um, I guess the lawyer's responsibility to his clients. And he always felt like his clients depended on him so that it wouldn't be fair to those clients to leave them and go do something else. And so he turned down those opportunities. That was back in the day when the senator, you know, the, 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 the uh, tenured senator in your state just offered you the job, and that was, that was how you got it. Um, I can remember Dad sitting on the patio uh, in the evening and neighbors coming by to sit and talk and ask legal questions. And I always thought about Atticus Finch, you know, and folks coming and asking him uh, advice. Um, I, I never got to practice law with Dad. He died six weeks after I graduated from law school. One but 54 years old. Um, but I have never forgotten the example that he set in connection with his dedication to his clients, the sense of responsibility that he had for those clients. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have Hank O'Neill as an adjunct faculty member during my law school days and Manley Brown, both of whom had tremendous impacts on me. Manley, for whatever reason, uh, took me under his wing. I had his course my second year during the spring of 72 and I remember talking with him about trying to find a summer job and uh, I wanted to be with a law firm. I had 
been with a governmental agency the summer before. And uh, he called me and said, go talk to Floyd Buford at Bird, Groover, and Buford. Well, I didn't know anything about Floyd Buford, but I did go down and he hired me. He knew my dad and uh, Garland Bird knew my dad and Denny Groover knew my dad. They, they were contemporaries. Some were in law school together here at Mercer with dad. And then I began to learn as I went down there in the afternoons and during the summer um, what kind of lawyers these guys were. Uh, Garland Byrd had been lieutenant governor. In fact, as a, a probably a ninth grader in high school, I was a page for Garland Byrd, though I didn't know who he was. And I'm not even sure I met him when I was at the Capitol that day as a youngster. Uh, but lieutenant governor, one of the foremost trial lawyers in the state. Uh, he could give a closing argument that would just, I mean, everybody was enthralled by what he was saying. Uh, Denmark Groover, now you all probably um, never, never heard of Pappy Boyington's Black Sheep Squadron. Anybody here have a clue who that is? Somebody? Yeah, a few do. During World War II, uh, the Marine Corps put together a, a squadron that, of course, they had a number of, of uh, squadron, fighter pilot squadrons, but they put together one with a major, uh, Gregory Boyington, I think it was, Greg Boyington, but they nicknamed Pappy because he was so much older than the, the 18, 19 year olds who were flying these uh, fighter planes. Sent them to the South Pacific to fight the Japanese. <clears throat> Denmark Groover was one of those uh, fighter pilots. Wounded, um, uh, while he was over there and able to get his plane back to the island and land it, thank goodness, but he, he lived with shrapnel in his leg and back uh, all through his life. But he, I mean, Semper Fi meant something to him. Um, he came back, went to law school, uh, became a, a legislator, served uh, off and on over four decades in the Georgia legislature. The last 15 years, that he was there, um, no matter who you talk to that had anything to do with legislation in Georgia would agree that before a bill was passed in the, in the Capitol, in the legislature, it had to be Grooverized mm -hmm. first. Uh, he, was, he was such a terrific lawyer and such a parliamentarian. I mean, he understood government and you know, what, how things work uh, in, the, in the legislature. But he would help people who were his opposition on the bill to get their bill right. Uh, people, uh, Republicans, would come to Groover to see how to best present their bill. Now, he might oppose it, and he'd tell them, but this is the way I would do it if I was you, kind of thing. I mean, he was well-respected, terrific trial lawyer. I mean, he and Hank O'Neill were the two best, and I, there were a couple of occasions when there were jury trials with Hank representing the plaintiff Groover for the defense and law students left class and went down to watch the trial uh, down at the courthouse. And it was, oh, I wish we'd had video back then or, or had thought to video what a learning experience that would be for generations of lawyers to watch that. Terrific lawyer. Um, and then Floyd Buford. Uh, Floyd grew up out here um, in, uh, uh, in the country, really, on a dirt road uh, outside of Macon. Uh, that's what I can't even think of the name of that little district out there, the Howard community. And uh, grew up working on roads, like his dad was a building a road contractor. Went to law school uh, after the war. Um, and of course, Droover and Byrd went after the war as well. Uh, went, became an assistant U.S. attorney and then later was appointed by John F. Kennedy as the uh, United States Attorney for the Middle District of Georgia. And what a formidable uh, adversary he was in the courtroom. Uh, he knew how to talk to country people. I mean, he grew up in the country. 
And he tried some of uh, the most famous uh, civil rights uh, criminal trials, um, the, the one that uh, ended up in the United States Supreme Court. They made movies about some, um, but just a tremendous lawyer. Um, so those were terrific mentors for me in law school. Now I will say this. Uh, Manly, when he told me about this job opportunity, he said, but you have to promise me one thing, Lamar. And I said, what is that? He said, first you're going to learn more than you'd ever learn anywhere else. And he's right. I was drawing petitions for writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in cases that had been tried in the Middle District, been to the Fifth Circuit at that time it was, and, uh, and up. I also just about every day went to the new way to get lunch. So the highs and lows of being a law clerk. Um, I was an errand boy too. Um, and now I've just lost my thought now that I was talking about uh, Manly, Manly said you got to oh, promise him one thing. Thank you, thank you. Have those moments now and then. What happens to you when you get to be 65? Uh, Manly uh, said, promise me uh, one thing. And told me about the good side. He said, promise me you will not adopt any of their personal habits. <laughs> and that was pretty good advice. Um, Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, they'd usually lock the door and bring out a bottle of scotch whiskey and we'd sit around the, the library table and tell stories or I'd listen to stories. And I remember Groover one time caught me researching and he said, Lamar, what are you looking for? And I, I told him what the facts were. And, looking up something from Mr. Buford. And he stood up there, a bookcase, like a great big bear scratching his back. And he said, I don't remember the page number, but if you look at 122 Appeals, Jones versus State, I think that'll help you. And sure enough, there it was. I mean, that was the case that was on point. And the only other person I ever saw that could do that was Hank O'Neill. I mean, Hank could give you book and page number just you know, top of his head. I just was amazed at that. Uh, but I then practiced law with Manley and with Hank. And I could not have had better mentors. I mean, I learned not just, you know, the tricks of the trade, if you will, or, or good habits, uh, <coughs> but I learned about ethics. Um, every time, you know, something would come up and you'd think, uh, gosh, is, is this really a, an issue? I mean, is this something I ought to be concerned about? Or, I mean, it smells a little bit, but I mean, it's passed the smell test with you guys. And, you know, they would analyze it and give you an answer. They'd give you the quick answer because they knew how they'd handle it immediately. But then they'd explain to you why. And uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on ethics and professionalism. But I learned an awful lot from those guys. I also learned all about law practice, how to treat clients. I mean, it's, but pick the right mentor. You know, I was on the disciplinary board for years, and so many of the bar complaints that we had to deal with, people who were in disciplinary uh, trouble, people about to be disbarred or reprimanded or suspended from the practice of law, I came to realize were people who had no mentor when they got out of law school. I mean, they got out, hung a shingle, and, you know, just used the do-it rule and, and did whatever sounded right, felt right, uh, without asking somebody who could give them good advice. And, uh, you know, the, the odds of failure are high uh, in, in terms of ethics if you don't have a mentor who can give you advice. So if you go to a big firm, you'll probably be assigned one, like in our firm, associates are assigned, an experienced lawyer is their mentor. The State Bar has a mentor program and they can assign mentors to people. Um, single most important thing you can do after graduation and passing the bar is get the right mentor. If you can't find one, call me and I'll do what I can to help you find one. Then, remember, as time goes by and you become an experienced lawyer, the second part of this is be a mentor. 
I mean, we all stand, you know, the expression, stand on the shoulders of the people who came before you. Well, every lawyer practicing law does that. And I think we have an obligation to return that or pay it forward, as the, another expression goes, and mentor others. And uh, so bear that in mind, just a suggestion from me. Well, that's a great suggestion. And if you talk to experienced lawyers and judges and you say, who was your mentor, they can all say it right away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things, of course, the students are learning about this semester <laughs> is um, how professionalism can be challenged when you're out there in practice in the deposition room or wherever, uh, and you know how you how that comes about and how you have to deal with it. You were in a particular kind of practice. You were in a trial practice, a, you know, personal injury practice. What kinds of things did you see that you would classify as professionalism issues, or civility being part of professionalism, and so on? Uh, what? Uh, tell them a story or two. Yeah, okay. I, can, I, can I, I, I can give them the theory. You, you tell them the, the yeah. story. When you practice law for 40 years, you've got a few of those stories. I, uh, a simple one, I, I remember. Um, right out of law school, a, a partner gave me a case, small case, a fender bender. He took it to get fixed, discovered that uh, rather than putting a new fender on there like he had said he wanted and what he paid for, he discovered they'd used Bondo. He just took a magnet and ran it across the, the fender and realized it wasn't sticking, you know, that the magnet was, was falling. So they sued him because he refused to pay them. And uh, so I get this with about uh, two days to go, uh, of our 30 days to answer this lawsuit, needed to file a counterclaim. So I called my friend and classmate across the street and I said, look, just got this, got to do some research, get an answer, I'm in the middle of a bunch of stuff, can I have an extra five days or an extra three days even? And he said, oh, no problem, but uh, I'll have to run it by my client. And I said, well, okay, well, call me back. No problem, he says. So about uh, five hours later, as the day is getting on, I call over and leave a message. Yes, uh, he's gone over to the, to the courthouse. I'll have him call you as soon as he gets back. Well, five o'clock came, and I thought, yeah, do I bug him again? I'll wait till in the morning. Next day is the last day. Called at 9 o'clock. Yeah, he was here, but he's run over to probate court, and I'll get him to call you. He did get your message, and he'll call you back. Well, about lunchtime, I called again. She said, yeah, he did, but he had to run out to Jones County. And, uh, you know, but he, he says he's going to get back to you. And I said, well, thank you. Well, I had to cancel everything I had in the afternoon because I couldn't wait any longer. And I went ahead and prepared the answer and counterclaim, did the research, got it filed just barely by 5 o'clock. And to this good day, he has never returned that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you know, not that it bothered me or anything, not much. Um, you know, the, the sad thing is that, that lawyer and classmate of mine who I've known, in fact, his wife, when he died, called me to go with her to pick out his casket. I mean, I, you know, I had that kind of relationship with them. Um, but now, as I think about this lawyer, what do I think about? I think about the way he took advantage of me, you know, trying to get me into a bind. Uh, you know, he wanted it to go by so that I'd have to have my client pay cost revenue. Mean, just, you know, a trivial thing. I will tell you, any lawyer who tells you he's got to talk to his client about <coughs> extending the time to answer a lawsuit or extending the time to answer discovery, you know, you be careful of that lawyer because uh, that's that's lawyering. I mean, you in charge of, of that sort of thing. And that's I've never. I've just told clients, you know, it may come around to where I'm the guy who needs the extension next time. I'm certainly going to give that's for me to decide. Um, 
I didn't appreciate that. And I, I realized what he was doing, and I saw him many times after that, and he never mentioned all of those messages there. Um, it, I saw a lawyer, you know, friend of mine, again, I mean, not social friends necessarily, but certainly professional friends, and a lot of, a lot of respect for him, and still do. And I, uh, still very cordial with him. But we had a case, a brain, I had a brain injured client, uh, he had a truck driver and trucking company, and I received in the mail one day a uh, deposition subpoena to the registrar at Fort Valley State College um, for the transcript and files, uh, the entire file of my client. Well, I mean, that file could contain some things that are not subject to being published, uh, confidential, privileged information. So I did what I typically would do if I've got something like that. I, I called over there and said, look, I tell you, I, I don't know what's in there any more than you do. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't I go ahead and get the file, because I can get an authorization from my client, run down there and get it. And I'll look through it, and if there's anything I think is privileged or confidential, I'll put it in an envelope, send a cover letter with it over to the judge, send you a copy of the letter, letting you know that I have sent some stuff over there, and we'll let the judge decide whether this is privileged or confidential. And uh, that way there won't be any disclosure of, of stuff prematurely, uh, and I'll give you everything else. That I don't, and I may not have an objection to any of it but I need to see the file first. And he just started laughing. And I said, well, what's so funny about that? He said, we've already got the file. I said, what do you mean you've got the file? He said, yeah, we went to the clerk's office, got her to sign the subpoena, jumped in the car, went down there, told them the deposition was next Tuesday or they could give us the file. They gave us the file. And we came on back to the office. I said, and then you put my copy of it in the mail so I would get it the next day or so. And he said, well, yeah, I mean, we got back. We mailed you your letter. I said, did it ever cross your mind that when you do that, there's no way for me to object in a timely fashion? I mean, you've got the file already, and I had no notice and no opportunity to object. Now, you know, let me think about this a little bit, because I knew that the State Bar's advisory board had issued uh, a, an opinion in 1980 that said to do what they did was to, uh, in, in fact, commit a fraud on the clerk, on the opposing counsel, on the opposing party, and on the judge that caused the subpoena to be issued. Because they didn't have any intention of doing a deposition. I mean, this was their way of getting the file without having to deal with an objection from anybody. Uh, so I wrote them a letter. I, I said to my friend, uh, here is advisory opinion 40. I want you to take a look at it. See if you agree with me that uh, what has been done here is not in accordance with this opinion. And if you tell me that you're just going to stick that into a file and uh, an envelope and seal it up and stick it in your file and never make reference to anything in that uh, file, as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of it. I'm not going to say anything. No need to say anything to the judge or anybody else. That's, we'll just go on as if that file doesn't exist. And. Uh, and he got back in touch with me a day or two later and said, no, I think I'm going to need that file. I think I'm going to use that file. So when we started filing motions in limine, I called it not just a motion in limine, but to suppress evidence. I was so mad I wanted to put an exclamation point on it and make it sound like a criminal motion. I mean, I was so mad. And we got over there with about 17 motions in limine to argue with the judge. And I had already you know, sent my motion to the judge with the, my letter attached to it as well as advisory opinion for him. So, 
I jumped up and said, Judge, I'd like to start with this Fort Valley thing. He said, no, no, Mr. Sizemore, let's just save that one for last. I'm going to go through these others first. So we go through the other 16, and he rules this way and this way. Well, you know, we get down. I said, now, Judge, I want to get to talk about Fort Valley. He said, sit down, Mr. Sizemore. I know your position. This is Wilcox, as you can, you can picture this. And he looks over at the other lawyer and says, Stand up, Mr. So-and-so. I want to hear what you have to say about the suggestion Mr. Sizemore made in his letter. Are you willing to put that in an envelope, seal it up in your file, and never make reference to it during the course of this trial? He said, well, Judge, we really think we need to use this. We just think it's going to. He said, let me tell you, you are not going to use that. You're going to put it in your file. You're going to seal it up. And I want you to go back to your office and you tell every lawyer in that office that if they pull a stunt like this, even though Mr. Sizemore didn't ask for sanctions to be imposed, he said, you tell them that the next time it happens, I'm imposing sanctions whether the lawyer asked for it or not. That's improper. It ought not to be done. You ought to be embarrassed about it and, and ashamed of what you did. <coughs> the ruling is... None of that is admissible in the course of this trial. Boy, I was just pumped up. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't have to argue a thing, you know. I had to open my mouth, really. Uh, but that's really what should have happened. And, and now that lawyer, despite being a friend, I mean, again, I'm not social acquaintances necessarily, but, but certainly professionally, I have a lot of respect for him. Um, he is on my list. Um, Hank O'Neill used to, to say, you know, when I'd say, well, God, we, we need to do something with this guy. We, I, don't wanna, I can't wait to get him in the crosshair. O'Neill would say, no, Omar, don't worry about that. I mean, don't be worried about getting revenge. All you have to do is just remember how to put him on your list. And I said, what list are you talking about? He said, I mean, the list up here. You know, you put him on, he can move up. He can move down, but he don't ever come off the list. <laughs> and, I mean, ever come off the list. And that means that when you deal with that person next time, there's certain precautions that you have to take. You don't treat him with the same um, liberal approach to, to things that you, you might another lawyer. And I'm, I'm happy to say that in 40 years, I can count uh, five lawyers that are maybe a judge, something else <laughs> that I can think of, but, but, it, but no more than five lawyers in 40 years. Um, but remember that. I mean, he can move up, he can move down, but he never comes off the list. And, and those are people that you deal with on a little different basis than you do everybody else. Like with the mentors, I think every lawyer I know has a list. That's right. I, I can right. tell you the ones on mine, and I haven't practiced yeah. in 24 years. So. <laughs> um, I want to I want to turn in just a second to your time as as Superior Court Judge, but uh, you've got to tell one story, and and that is the deposition in Tifton. Oh Lord! Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 and, and and then I I want the students to hear what it was like to be a judge. Yeah, this is it goes in the category of professionalism. I would think it's not an ethical thing. <clears throat> A friend of mine from Tifton asked me to associate on a case with him, help him in a life insurance policy case. The question was whether it was a suicide or a homicide or an accident, because if it was suicide, it was still within the, the period that wouldn't allow a recovery. Um, if it was accident or homicide, then certainly uh, the policy would take. Our client, the the widow was, uh, and we actually did it here in Macon in our conference room, but my lawyer friend was from Tifton, and the other lawyer was from Atlanta. And he's a guy who's on my list, one of the, one of the few. And he's on my friend's list, big time, on my friend's list. Um, we were taking the, they were taking the deposition. The defendant was asking questions of our client. And my friend, who is, you know, kind of a, big guy, kind of a bulldog personality, and, you know, he didn't like the, the, some of the questions, so he objected and said, I don't understand the question. The lawyer on the 
on the side just to provoke him a little bit, said, frankly, I don't care whether you understand the question. It's the witness. I want to understand the questions. I don't care whether you do. And he said, well, by gosh, she's not going to answer a question unless I understand what you're asking. I'm going to instruct her not to answer. Well, all right, so he tries to explain the question. He said, well, I still don't understand it. I'm not objecting. He said, well, by gosh, I've explained it to you in English. I'll do it in German if that helps. And then my friend stands up and says, well, by God, I'll spreck it with you. And the next thing you know, they're shouting at each other in German. And the court reporter's trying to take it down phonetically. And finally just quit. And you know, my, you know, my, my client, her eyes were that big. I said, time out, time out. We're going to take a break. And I had to take my friend, I had to get him to quit speaking German. <laughs> Come with me to my office along with our client. But, so that, I guess, would go in the, in the category of professional. It's not really professional to threaten and then to break into a uh, German. <laughs> I need to learn what the German for professional is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I actually have that videotape. We were, the lawyer who was, on our, who was on our list was on our list for a reason. And we thought having a camera there and videotaping this would sort of tone him down because he'd know we could play it to the, and hear the snide, the tone of voice, and you know, see the sneer on his face and that kind of thing. Um, but I now have it, and I've threatened my friend from Tifton uh, to, about showing it sometime, and I, I haven't done that. Oh, I would love to have that. <laughs> I'd have to run you a clip. Um, after all those many years of representing plaintiffs, uh, you had the opportunity to become a Superior Court judge um, and spent 10 years. 10 years, ten, exactly. 10, ten years. years uh, and I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about what you liked about that, mm -hmm. uh, what you didn't like about it, and, and maybe a little bit about why you stepped down. It's, it's unusual yeah. for judges to, to ever give up that rope, uh, and you did. Uh, and I was wondering if you could just tell the students a little bit about that experience, sure. pro and con. Sure, I'm glad to. Uh, in, uh, I guess it was January the 3rd of 2001, Governor Barnes swore me in to become a Superior Court judge. We have five uh, here in Macon for our circuit, which includes Peach County, Crawford County, and Bibb. I'd practiced law for 27 years, you know, all of it. Uh, basically all of it, personal injury work, insurance work, and I really felt like I just needed a change professionally, I needed to do something different. And uh, this opportunity came up, and I loved uh, the variety of work. I mean, I, I was also very apprehensive. It had been a long time since I'd handled criminal cases, never dealt really with domestic relations cases. Um, and I, but I enjoyed learning this, about, and I, I had lots of horn books around my desk and code. You know, my room became always, always read the code section. <laughs> Don't just try to remember and, and go off of that. I mean, every time I'd pick up a, a foreclosure uh, confirmation uh, case to deal with, I'd have to go to the code and I'd read, read the code sections again. But it was interesting, it was new, it was different. Um, you know, I, I felt like I was really um, serving the community. I'd never really done any public service work before. And I'd always felt like everybody owes a duty to their community to, to do some sort of public, whether it's, you know, Red Cross or United Way or Boy Scouts or whatever it is. And if you have the opportunity to serve your profession, you know, I, I just felt like I, this was an opportunity for me to do that. And when I went in, I didn't know whether I'd do it forever or not. Um, and so I, uh, I enjoyed the jury trial. I mean, that was my favorite part of it. I had 124 jury trials to verdict or mistrial uh, in that 10 years, and that was to me, really the highlight. I mean, that's what it's all about, from, was for me. Talking to the jury, helping the jurors understand what was going on and why, helping them uh, 
uh, I hoped develop an appreciation for the system and the importance of what we were doing, the significance of it to the community. Um, enjoyed the people in the courthouse, uh, great people working over there. I enjoyed the lawyers, the interaction with lawyers. Um, I had been mediating cases as part of my law practice <laughs> since 1988, so from 88 through 2000. And I loved that interaction with lawyers about cases. Um, and, I, and, and so, you know, that was part of what I enjoyed about being a Superior Court judge. I love pretrial conferences, sitting talking about issues and motions in limine and, you know, well, what about this and, and why do you think this will work and you can do that and just challenging. Um, I hated deciding who was going to take the children home uh, in a a child custody case. Those are tough, tough cases. And, and it's, my wife likes to quote me as saying there were many times when my view was I wanted to take the kids home because I didn't think either parent was fit to have them. And um, those are just tough, tough decisions. I, mean, I, I will tell you, I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, a spirit court judge, you know, just going over there to retire. That is the toughest job in our profession, being a trial judge, bar none, the toughest job in, in the profession. Spirit, I mean, uh, Supreme Court justices will, will tell you that. I, mean, I had several tell me, you got the hard job. You know, we sit up here and read cases and write opinions and proofread, and you have to deal face to face with the people who are losing the children or who are fixing to go to the penitentiary. And you start thinking about the ripple effect of that decision. And every day you make hundreds of decisions. I mean, it may be just signing orders, uh, but you make uh, literally hundreds of decisions. Uh, and in the courtroom, when you're sentencing somebody and you've got the uh, defendant standing in front of you and his family sitting over here, over here you've got the prosecution sitting at the table and behind the prosecution is the victim's family. Uh, this person who's gone, who they'll never see again. And you're having to impose sentence on this person uh, who's got a family, got, you know, wife and kids and all of this. I mean, those are tough decisions. If you sit there, you can be, and this is one of the things a judge can never let himself be, and that is paralyzed by the weight of the decision. But I can see how judges can get paralyzed by that. I mean, to, to pronounce a sentence that has the sort of impact it does on not just those people sitting there, but the extended family or the, the employer he works for uh, or others. I mean, every decision just sort of spreads across the, the community, at least to a limited extent. Tough, tough job. If you did it long enough, I would think some people would become desensitized mm -hmm. to it, and, and, it, and it wouldn't bother them, and that should bother us. Did you see that? I, mean, I did. It didn't happen to you, but... Yeah, I, I did see that. That was one of the reasons, after 10 years, I thought, well, you know, I miss law practice, I miss the camaraderie of a law office, I miss mediating cases, and now is better than four more years from now, and... Uh, so I'll have phase three, uh, mostly mediating. Uh, but yeah, I did see that. Um, you know, I, I saw a judge uh, who would, on calendar call in a major felony criminal calendar, would get all the lawyers, all the parties in the courtroom, call the calendar, they were gonna take pleas that day, um, jurors waiting, and would make everybody stay in the courtroom um, while pleas started and, and start taking, the judge would start taking the pleas, never tell anybody in what order these pleas are going to be taken, but not letting anybody leave the courtroom. So the prosecutors who needed to be preparing for a jury trial tomorrow morning were having to sit there all day, waiting on, not knowing when the case would be called. And the judge might go in and eat a, a quick salad or half a sandwich. Nobody else could leave the courtroom and come right back and go on the play. And then pick a jury at 7 o'clock at night. I mean, jurors has been sitting there all day long, 
and into the evening, not planning to be there past five or six o'clock, and you pick a jury. Now that's that's a judge who has forgotten what it's like to practice law. Forgotten that you, you know, you got other clients, you have other responsibilities. Uh, time spent sitting through another proceeding, somebody else's proceeding, is wasted time for a lawyer. And it, uh, you, you know, I mean, it was just. And this judge was was otherwise a terrific judge. I mean, smart. Um, you knew the opinion written by that judge was the right opinion. And nobody ever really questioned the rulings of that judge. They were, they were so good, so precise. But that judge forgot what it was like to be a lawyer. And, and when you do that, you become a tyrant. I mean, you just, you know, it doesn't make any difference. And a judge can become a bully. I mean, because who's going to cross the judge, right? I mean, you can sit there and talk just as mean and harshly to people. You can be like Judge Judy, you know. And that's when I went over there. That was one of the things that used to drive my wife crazy. Is her friends would say, "Well, is Lamar going to be like Judge Judy?" Is Lamar, you know, the image people have of judges. But there are some who are like that, and it's uh, it's unpleasant for lawyers. It's it's uh, embarrassing for lawyers. I mean, some judges will embarrass lawyers in the presence of their clients. I just think that's that's awful, or in the presence of the jury. I think the better practice is if somebody does something wrong, you call them up to the bench and you have a little private <coughs> conference with them. I'll never forget a guy in the middle of a trial, uh, somebody, the prosecution objected, I sustained the objection, he took his legal pad and went over to his table, his counsel table, threw that pad down, and it hit, I mean, I don't know how you could ever again repeat the way it hit, because it was it hit perfectly flat, but it went kapow when it hit. I mean, it didn't just lay down on that table. <laughs> and then it started sliding across the table. And as it slid across the table, I mean, time stopped. <laughs> Nobody said a word, but everybody watched that pad slide across that table. And it slid right in front of the defendant. Did he reach out to stop it? Uh-uh, he, he wasn't touching that pad. And it slid till it was stopped finally, hanging over the other end of the table. And he looked at me, I did like this, and we had a little talk up at the bench. But I didn't chew him out in front of the jury, in front of his client, I didn't, you know, I mean, we don't talk, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, that's not professional, by the way, to throw your pad down in response to a ruling by the judge. But, uh, but nor should the judge chew him out, uh, I don't think. Um, anyway, I just one of those things. Well, it is. Uh, I've done a very bad job managing our time this morning, Judge, and so, uh, of course, you have a whole another career uh, now mediating, but yeah. to preserve time, I'm, I, I want to make sure the students have a chance to ask you questions. I'm going to ask you my last question, which is, as you know, an open-ended question. I mean, you have the whole first-year class uh, yeah. here. Uh, and I was wondering if there's anything that, anything, you want to make sure that they hear, uh, maybe something you wish you had heard, uh, and then I'll turn it over to the students for their questions. Well, I don't know that I've got anything uh, so profound to say that I wish I had heard it before. I, I will say this, though, just a piece of advice. We were talking about the lawyers on the list. Whatever you do, don't become the lawyer you hate. You know, I don't ever want to be like the lawyers on my list. I mean, if I find myself um, in a deposition getting so worked up that I'm fixing to figuratively break into German, uh, I'm going, I know I've got to to stop uh, and, and, and take stock of what I'm doing. So uh, one piece of advice, don't become the lawyer you hate. Don't repeat the practices that make you uh, so angry at this lawyer. Um, advice I give to young judges 
consists of three things. Uh, and this, the first one goes back to the judge who forgot what it was like to be a lawyer. Number one, remember that first, you were a lawyer. If you ever forget that, you become a tyrant. You gotta remember what it's like. You serve lawyers, I think. I mean, I realize the community, you know, that's your constituency. The lawyers are your real, you're there to help lawyers get their cases handled and their clients looked after as uh, fairly, uh, uh, equitably uh, and expeditiously as you can. I mean, do things to make uh, the business of the court convenient for lawyers. Number two, uh, criminal cases err on the side of mercy. That's what I told every new, law, new judge that came to the courthouse, err on the side of mercy. And finally, just rule. Uh, one of my dad's law partners, who's like an uncle to me, I've known him all my life, Bob Hicks, who's in Atlanta. Um, Bob uh, said that the raison d'etre, the reason for being of a judge is to rule. And if you can't rule, you ain't any business being a judge. So as hard as it is, don't be paralyzed by the difficulty of the issues, the weight of the issues, the, the people who are going to be affected by your ruling rule. They can't go anywhere else until you rule. I mean, time is literally standing still for them. Nobody's, you know, <coughs> justice delayed is justice denied kind of thing. I mean, that's real. If you don't rule, they can't go anywhere else. They can't do anything else. And so, finally, just rule. And I guess, well, one other piece of advice. Uh, for the 10 years I was at the courthouse, I was blessed uh, through Professor Longin and, and Professor Floyd to have interns, and we had law clerks. And in 10 years, I had 34 interns and law clerks. And Everyone received, uh, at the end of their little time with me, a hardbound copy of To Kill a Mockingbird with a note in the front to read this book every five years or so during your legal career to remind yourself of the example of Atticus Finch. I realize fictional character, okay? but. Uh, there's a book out that I that came out during the 50th anniversary of To Kill a Mockingbird, um, and Scott Turow wrote one of the several essays in this book, and uh, he pointed out that uh, just because there aren't many, and in parentheses he said, if any, people in the world like Atticus Finch, does not mean that you can't aspire to be like Atticus Finch. And as idealistic as that sounds, I think you need to have a little idealism about you practicing law. Uh, you have to think about the ideals of our profession and the good of the community. And read To Kill a Mockingbird every five years or so just to remind you of that example of Atticus Finch, which is sort of my role model for good advice. What students, as uh, students, what questions do you all have uh, for Judge Sizemore? Good. Are you telling the story? Answer to all their questions. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll ask a question. Um, you talked a lot about. Thank you for joining us today. You talked a lot about um, finding a mentor, um, and uh, I'm sure we all have people in our lives that, that we look up to, and um, some of us have parents who, who are lawyers or, or close friends who are attorneys. Um, but but the, I, I, the problem I find with finding a mentor is when to know that you found the right one. Um, uh, you know, some of us have very different interests in law, and uh, if Mr. O'Neill or um, Manley uh, was, uh, uh, was interested in a certain aspect of the law that you weren't, would they still be uh, appropriate mentors? How do we know when a mentor is an Atticus Finch or something much lesser? You, you, you really need to talk to folks in the community, I guess, talk to some lawyers or law professors. I mean, Professor Longin and other 
faculty members, they know the lawyers in town. They're involved in the Boodle and of court and Macon Bar, and you know they know who's uh, interested in, in law students and interested in helping law students, and uh, certainly they can uh, can help you identify people, and they can they can direct you to people who who are familiar uh, with lawyers in Macon and can you know let you go see. I've, I've dealt with met with several people in law school who graduating, they were going to be practicing in Macon, they thought they were going to be uh, practicing solo, and uh, you know, I, one of them I have been, uh, tried to be a mentor for, and I have suggested names and talked to lawyers about uh, whether they'd be willing to serve as mentors for others, and so I mean, that's one way to do it. If you're in a firm like our firm, Sell and Melton, you know, you've got a lot of experienced lawyers, uh, ethical lawyers, and, uh, and the firm typically will assign somebody. You may find that your interests differ. And you don't have to, to I mean, Hank O'Neill, I was never assigned to Hank O'Neill as my mentor. I mean, I just worked with him. I mean, he was my mentor. Manly is the same way. Bird, Groover, and Buford. I mean, I, I didn't go over there uh, at the time looking for mentors. They just turned out to be, and I had somebody like Manly directing me to them. Yeah, why Manly Brown took an interest in me as a law student, a second year law student, I'll never know. But, but I'm forever grateful for it because it did. It had such an impact on virtually all of my career. Not just practicing with him, the area of law, but teaching at the law school. Uh, he and Hank did that. Um, you know, working in Georgia Trial Lawyers Association, he did that. Um, he's, he was on the Board of Bar Examiners. Here I am on the Board of Bar Examiners now, these years later. So, you know, you just Sometimes you just luck into a mentor. But my suggestion to you is that you talk to professors or, or, or somebody like me who's been around a few years and got gray hair and enough to know who's in the community and who'd be a good mentor. I think we have time for one, one more. Yes, ma'am. I was just curious if <clears throat> are you still adjunct here at Mercer? I do. I, this is my uh, 34th year of teaching my problems in insurance litigation. And Wednesday morning, uh, assuming the snow is not covering the ground, we'll be here at 8 o'clock talking about automobile insurance. <laughs> Judge, we've got about one minute. Okay. And I know one of the things that comes up is students say, well, you talk about incivility and this yelling in German. and." <laughs> one of the hard things for a student to imagine just dealing with that. And in the one minute left to us, this is totally unfair to you. Could you talk a little bit about that? I know you've used the phrase mm -hmm. before with me, observing the formality. Yeah, yeah. Could you tell them a little bit about that and then we'll close? Yeah. A quick example uh, of this. Uh, my daughter's automobile was damaged. A young lady ran a stop sign and ran into it. And I was dealing with an insurance adjuster could just as easily have been a lawyer, same kind of setting. And I knew that I was entitled to the difference between the value of the car before it was damaged and the value of the car after it was damaged. And that's, that's really what the measure of damages is on a property damage claim. We always think about repairs, but repairs usually uh, are not as expensive or not as much money as the difference in fair market value. Well, it's an older car. They wanted to just replace the fender and paint the fender. Well, then you'd have a pretty shiny blue fender here and a dull blue everywhere else. And so I said to the adjuster over the phone, I tell you, rather than asking for the difference between fair market value, which would be greater than this amount, I've talked to the body shop and they can paint the whole car and do the fender for this lesser amount and I'm perfectly content to do that. I mean, you don't have to worry about difference. Well, you, sorry, lawyer, and he starts cussing at me 
and calling me a shyster and uh, various other things. And I said, wait a minute, we, <laughs> we don't have to have this conversation. He said, well, you by gosh, we do too, because I'm the guy making the decision on this. I said, I don't ever have to talk to you again. We're going to end the conversation. He said, yes, you are going to talk to me. I said, look, all I have to do is sue your insured, and from now on, I'll talk to your lawyer. And I hung up the phone. The next day, he called back very sheepishly and said, all right, we'll pay to have the, the whole car painted, because he knew it was a better deal than what I was really entitled to. Uh, that's an example of what you have to do when you're dealing with people that are just totally unreasonable. You deal with lawyers, um, my view is you try to get along. You, you try to find ways to accommodate each other because it makes life easier for you, it makes life easier for the other guy. But if you've got somebody who wants to make a fight out of everything. And I've known lawyers that they wouldn't schedule a deposition with you without having a heated argument about it. What I always say to law students, um, and what I say to lawyers like that, is we don't have to have this unpleasant conversation. From this point on, we'll just observe the formalities. By that I mean Civil Practice Act is there to guide us both. The rules are there to get us through this even if we don't like each other. And from now on, we'll observe the rules. You can do it by the book, and, the there, book. and there is a book. There is a book. All right, Judge, thank you very much.